All right. We actually need to pick up in Colossians 1.24. We're just going to finish out the last few verses of Colossians 1 real quick, and then we'll jump into Colossians 2. So let's read Colossians 1.24 to 29, please. Who will grab that for us? Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I... I do not care on behalf of this body, of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ. Of this church, I was made a master according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the matter which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but it has now been manifested to his spirit, to, to his saints, in whom God will to make known what is the riches of glory of his ministry among the Gentiles, which is which in Christ in you the hope of glory. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose also I labor, striving <clears throat> according to his power, which mightily works within me. All right, so verse 24, in what does Paul rejoice? Sufferings. Sufferings, right? That's hard for us to practice, I think, at times. Uh, Paul said he rejoiced in the Bible, admonishes us to rejoice. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, but I don't know about you, when I fall into a trial, when I am experience something that's painful, emotionally painful, uh, it's not my first instinct to rejoice or to be thankful for that. But Paul saying he rejoices in his suffering, but what's the, the purpose of the point of his suffering? Why is he going through suffering? Okay. His work and labor among the gospel. He experienced suffering because of that. Um, so he says that he wants to fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. He's not saying that Christ fell short of a full sacrifice or a full suffering. He's talking about the things that he has to give Christ to fill up that measure. What would be the full measure of Paul's sufferings in Christ? If he doesn't... If he hasn't reached that yet, what's the fullness? Paul? Well, I, I think our suffering, all of our suffering, has come from purging out the old and, and bringing in the new. Because we got one idea and, and God got another. And through, through our suffering, we change. There, there is a part of that, of self-sacrifice, of discipline, of serving God, making those changes. Then there's also this idea that he's presenting to us that in his service to God, Satan is attacking him. Mike? Well, I was going to say, maybe that full measure all the way up to death. Yeah. Right, exactly. He's, he's willing. He's more than willing. to. He, he's happy to give his life for Christ, as Christ gave his life for him. Now, there at the end of verse 24, he says, it's on behalf of something or someone's for the body of Christ for the church so that helps us to understand Paul's view of the church today it seems people dismiss or maybe don't appreciate the church as they should so he says but I'm doing this for the body of Christ I'm suffering in order to help it to benefit it if you will so then he talks about verses 25 to 27 
that he was serving to do what? What was his role? We talked about this before, so let's just touch on it. What's he doing in this time period? This, or as he is suffering and laboring? We're here to fulfill the word of God. So, <clears throat> okay. I'm guessing that would be an indication of the bringing about the revelation that's coming to him. Presenting the letters and such. Yeah, and he's talking about these things that were hidden. Now they're being revealed. That's that's what I'm laboring in to, to get the truth out there. That That's what I'm doing. And notice that he says here that as he's doing this and as he has this, as he's fulfilling the role of a minister, that he has a stewardship. So he says, I, I have responsibility here. I have to take care in how I handle this. And we would all have that type of stewardship in the Lord. Whatever he puts within us, whatever he has given to us, we need to be good stewards of that. Well, you can also see in this that <clears throat> him being a minister to them and a steward to them is not something that's just a convenience for him. He's going through these sufferings, and yet he's still a minister and still a steward to them. And a lot of times I believe that we don't kind of understand that idea that if something is inconvenient for us, then we just kind of push off and we prioritize whatever the suffering is or whatever the, we, we need to be doing. And uh, Paul's not like that. And, you know, even in his sufferings, he still helped to do everything that he possibly could for the church. Yes, he committed himself to this. Remember, uh, he mentioned in the book of Acts when he was recounting about the vision that he had with Christ and about him being told about the sufferings he would experience, he says, I was not disobedient to that vision. And that implies he could have refused to do what the Lord wanted him to do. But here he's pointing out, I have embraced it even in the midst of this suffering, but I rejoice because I have this stewardship. I have this great blessing of being able to labor and revealing the truth. So, Question number seven on that lesson, I had asked, how did Paul preach Christ in verse 28? So how did he preach him? He gives some spe a specific description there. Verse 28, Colossians 1, 28. He did it with wisdom and understanding that, that certain individuals need certain things and they need to hear certain things and so he did it with wisdom he did it with um, whenever he says uh, among the um, sorry, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man so he did it without discretion also I mean and he still talked to everyone that he spoke to and you know or, or he talked to everyone that he spoke to and you know I think that we really lack that sometimes okay he, anybody else have anything on that, by the way? Uh, he, he warned people. I mean, it's one thing to tell people about Christ. It's another, I mean, it's all part and parcel, but it's very specifically another thing to warn people that they're going to lose their soul. That's a, a stronger message in some regard, because the world is willing, at least people here are willing to say, uh, I, I want to tell you about Jesus. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about Jesus. They believe in Jesus. But warning is a different thing. Right. There, there's one side of it that says heaven is great. You can have eternal life and peace and rest and no tears. And there's some people who hear that message they are like, sounds good, but I really like what I have now. On the other side is you're going to burn in hell and suffer in torment forever and ever if you don't change your life. Oh, God gives us both of those things as motivating factors to want to serve Him and to do His will. So, yes, He is warning every man, admonishing some translations have, teaching every man in all wisdom. He, his point, as we talked about before in other letters, He wants to save souls. That's why He's teaching in a way that He is doing His best to help others to have their sins forgiven and have the hope of eternal life. Any other thoughts there?
Clint. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 5, he says basically the same message to, to the church of Corinth. <laughs> It says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. So it's, it's, it's the bad, the sufferings, and the good, the blessings, the consolations. Right. Mike. Yeah, I wanted to back up just a minute where he talks about in verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages past, and all of these things that... Um, in, in generations from past, but has now been manifested to the same. So we're very fortunate. It, these are things that the prophets wanted to know about. They would prophesy these things, but they couldn't quite come to a complete understanding because they're still shrouded in mystery. Now the mystery has been revealed to us, and you know how fortunate we are to understand and be able to look back on their prophecies and see how everything kind of fits together. Yes, great privilege. We stand in a position of great privilege. Ron. We also understand that Paul preached the gospel unashamedly. In Romans 1 and verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of mm -hmm. Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Exactly. So we also get other insight into how he postured himself before others. Right. He, he wasn't holding back or covering up because he was afraid of people's reactions or embarrassment or anything like that. He declared it openly and fully that those souls may be saved. Let's jump into Colossians 2 now. Colossians 2, let's read verses 1 through 3. Who will grab that for us? Rick. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. For as many as have not seen my faith in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay. So, Paul says in the New King James, he has a conflict. What's he saying about this conflict, how might you word that? It says for those at Colossae and where else? At Laodicea. What's his concern? Seems to be that he's concerned because they haven't seen him personally. Okay, there are those who haven't seen him personally. Maybe they're not as fully devoted as they should be, maybe just because they haven't had his presence there, maybe. Okay. They're, they're not as encouraged as they need to be, and they're not together as one as they should be. Okay, remember, in this letter, you have him dealing with a problem with these false teachers coming in and chapter 2 really gets into it and their stress and their strain that's coming among the brethren and, and hitting them. So it's evidently hitting at Laodicea as well as Colossae here. And he says, here, here's my concern. I want your hearts to be encouraged, knit together in love, as Chris just pointed out, to have the knowledge of the mystery of God. He wants their faith and their steadfastness to be assured, to, to be solid, if you will. So he's concerned about that. Now, I want to make a point about this. As Rick brought out, as many as not seen my face in the flesh, how would we put that? I've not met you. Okay, not met you. So I don't trust you. Okay, so I don't trust you, maybe. But what else? What, how, how would we put it? Not familiar with the word. No, no, no. You see, he's talking about, like I wouldn't say, you know, I've not met them in the flesh. What would I say? I know of them. In person. Right. In person, face to face. Nothing replaces face to face. Nothing. Okay? We've got this um, technology now. We can hop on FaceTime. We can get on Zoom calls or Google Meet calls or whatever it is. Nothing will ever replace face-to-face, -face, being in the same room, being in each other's presence, seeing each other's faces. 
They, they've done studies where even on the video calls, there are things we miss in communication that we get when we're face to face. It's a different experience. That's why watching a sporting event, and we'll just say college because all the pros are terrible, watching a sporting event is different sitting there watching it on your TV, even in high definition with that zoom in on those things, or being right there is completely different experience. Being here together is different than somebody watching a video of things. So Paul's saying, I wish I was face to face with you. It would change the dynamic. It would help the relationship. I could encourage you personally being there. But be that as it may, verses 2 and 3. He says they can put their complete faith in Christ. And question number one I asked, what may be found in Christ? What does he describe here? Well, first he calls it a treasure, so he values it for them. And then he says wisdom and knowledge. Yes. Knowing and knowing how to use what you know. Okay, very good point on that. Jim, do you have something? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you asked what can be found in Christ. What, what Paul's saying here. Uh -huh. Okay, I've lost about 80, 90% of my hair in the left ear. But... The way I see it, what can be found in Christ is everything. Everything we need to know and for us to uh, follow it daily. Forsaking ourselves to follow it and spread His Word. I mean, that's what He wanted. He gave His sermon. His, he laid out God's plans to the, in the first century to the first apostles so that they could go throughout the world and carry out his message. And of course, through the millennia, it's got perverted and changed. And right. But as you're saying, the knowledge and the wisdom, that understanding and the proper application of that understanding, all treasures and knowledge of uh, wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. So there's no need to search anywhere else for this wisdom and knowledge. It's all right there in Him. And the, the knowledge and wisdom that is found in Christ, the benefits we receive from that far exceeds knowledge and wisdom in any other field. You know, there's scientific pursuits, there's people who understand economics and things like that, or engineering, or astrophysics, or you know, whatever it is, whatever wisdom and knowledge is in this world, there is none that has as great a benefit as that which we find in Christ. Now, for treasures, for treasure, how do you get treasures? Just generally speaking. Hunt for them. You hunt for them. All right. So we, we have this you know treasure hunt. We talk about things, but how do you, how do you do that? If you if you have a treasure. How, how are you going to get that? And generally, so you think of treasure, you think of gold, you think of silver, you think of diamonds, things like that. How do you get those things? Search. You search for them. Clint? Sometimes we'll need a map. We'll need tools. We'll need things to get towards that treasure besides you know, just means. Mining. Mining. That's the one I was looking for. But yeah, all, all that truth. But my, you have to mine, you have to dig, you have to go after it, you have to search for it, you have to apply yourself if you're going to find that. Um, the scripture, you go through it, you can read it, you can get a basic understanding. But as you grow, as you mature through the years, you continue to read, you continue to study, you meditate, there's more and more value, more and more beauty, more knowledge, more wisdom in there. It's inexhaustible. But it's all right there for you if you'll just mine it from the Scripture. Any other thoughts there? All right then. Let's jump now to verses 4 through 10. Colossians 2, 4 through 10. Who will read that for us? I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. 
For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in, in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ and Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity, of de 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 deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him you have been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. Alright, so He says there in verse 4 that beware you know, lest people deceive you or delude you with persuasive words. Question number two I ask, what kind of persuasive words do people use to delude us or deceive us? Another way. Okay, there's, there's another way. There are many ways to heaven. Oh, there's many ways to heaven. Yeah, yeah don't, don't worry about the way. Or don't take it so literally. Oh, don't take it so literally. Does it truly mean everything it says? Right. Yeah. God is love. Oh, what do they mean by that? God is love, but what do they mean by that? We're all saved. We're all, we're all on the same path. We're all, we're all His children. God doesn't condemn people. Jesus doesn't condemn. I've heard that. Jesus doesn't condemn people. Have you actually read the Bible? There's, there's no way you could come away in any honesty and believe that. Actually. I saw a bumper sticker yesterday and it said God is too big for one religion. God is too big for one religion. Oh, man. Day of judgment's going to be really hard. Uh, a lot of people say that the important thing is we all believe in God. You go where you go, I go where I go, but we all believe in the same thing. Hey, we all believe in Jesus. Who else believes in Jesus? Demons. Demons. They, they, they believe more than we do. They, they know for a fact, right? Uh, a very prominent one is God wants you to be happy. So that means you do whatever makes you happy. God wants you to be happy. Heard that a long time ago. God, uh, uh, a guy told me, you know, God, don't you believe God wants you to be happy? I said, no. I said, God wants me to be right. My, my emotional state is beside the point. God wants me to be right. Now, happiness flows from that. Yeah. But their concept of God wants you to be happy is you do whatever makes you feel good. And you see a society that's filled with that. Clint, did you have something? See the sinner's prayer. Okay, say the sinner's prayer. You just say the sinner's prayer, put your hand on the TV, send me a hundred bucks, and you're good to go. Right? Right. Also, we hear people say, well, I don't see anything wrong with it, and certainly it must be a good thing, and God didn't say not to do this. Yes, exactly right. Exactly. Well, you know, it doesn't say not to. That's one of the one of the big ones out there. Um, it's so much fun. You'll have such a good time. Uh, oh, did you not know the Bible contradicts science? What a shock! That's. I mean, they will just tell us flat out. So, does the Bible contradict science? Not true science. Not true science. Pseudo no. Science. Yeah. Now, theory. It contradicts man's theories for sure, but true science, no, it doesn't do that. Um, and they'll say, well, you know, believe the science because they, they found an alcoholic gene, they found an adultery gene, or they found a whatever kind of gene, homosexual gene. Well, they found that. There, there's genes. No. <laughs> no. That's not science. That's not reality. That's not truth. Um, Anything else? Clint, one more. Kind of started at the very beginning. You, know, you won't die. You know, Satan so came right out and told Eve the exact opposite of what God had said. I mean, 
could be in your plane, you will not die. And, and that's what we see today. People just say the exact opposite of what God says. And somehow it's accepted or it's received. Right. Well, I don't like this point to very little. But um, Peter says that exactly the same thing. As a matter of fact, he references Paul's thinking on this. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse um, 16, it says, in all his letters, and talking about Paul, as in all, all his letters speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, you need to be on guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men involved in your own steadfastness, but instead grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look at there in Colossians, where he's talking about in uh, verse 5 that you need to have stability in your faith. You cannot be unstable. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You need to have that stability because these deceiving words are going to come. There's going to be these delusions that come. There are going to be many people who accept them and we are to be on guard, not to be caught up and swept away with them. Um, no matter what the source is or how good it sounds, we, we need to make sure we are firm in Christ as we're getting ready to look at. So question three is how do we receive Christ? Verse six. How do we receive Christ? How do we receive the Holy Spirit? How do we receive the Father? What does the scripture tell us? Repentance and baptism. Okay, that is true. How do we get there? Believe. Okay. All right, follow with me on this, all right? Let's go to 3 John, verse 9. 3 John, verse 9. This is to see the principle at play. 3 John, verse 9. Who will read that for us? Clint. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not perceive us. Okay. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes does not receive us. What's he saying? He won't accept them. He won't accept me in the letter that was written. He won't accept that message that was given. So if he did accept the message, what would it mean relative to his relationship with John? They would be as one. They would be as one. He would have received John. Because he says, I wrote, but he didn't receive us. Not that he didn't receive the letter, you see. He says he didn't receive us. So to reject... Paul or reject John is to reject his writing, his message, right? So Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. Matthew 10, verse 40. We'll read that for us. Go ahead, Mike. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me, him who sent me. Okay. So how do we receive the Father and the Son. By believing. By believing, what does the Lord lay out in Matthew 10 40? Receive Christ, receive the Father. Okay, how do you receive Christ? Through His Word. Okay, He says, He who receives you, He's talking to the apostles, receives me. We've already seen where John in writing says, Look, I wrote a message. And Diotrephes didn't receive us. So the opposite is true. If you receive that message, you receive John. If you receive John, you receive Christ. If you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, that he, who He sent, right? In between those two. And you receive the Father. You receive them through the message, is the point. Because our world is completely uh, askew on this. They, they separate receiving the Lord from receiving His message. The receiving the Lord is some mysterious, mystic, experience or feeling and the Bible lays out very clearly it's through the message of the word that we receive 
the apostles, receive the Spirit, receive Christ, receive the Father. That's the process that's given to us here. So we receive them through receiving the Word. Now let's jump back to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. He says, so you receive Him, you walk in Him, walk in His truth, abide in His truth. Verse 7 then, He tells us how are we to be? What are we to do? Rooted. rooted. What does rooted mean? Okay, firmly planted. What do roots do for a plant or a tree? Okay, they'll, they'll grow out. Sometimes there's a tap root, like one main root that goes down. It anchors itself in, uh, it anchors itself in securing itself in position. It anchors them in, but what else do they do? Nourishes. They receive the nutrients, right, from the soil. That's, that's what roots do. Right, so there's an anchoring aspect to it. There's drawing the nourishment built up. What is it to build up? Increase in knowledge. Okay, increase in knowledge, increase in strength, in wisdom, established in the faith. Stability, again, being emphasized there. And being what? Abounding with, verse 7? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. We need to have that appreciation for what the Lord has done and that relationship we have in Him. Question number four, what do traditions of men do, verse eight? They change. They do change, absolutely do. They hinder our spiritual growth. They confound our thinking, put us in conflict with God's word, and then our thoughts become distorted. Yes, any other thoughts there? Well, they're, where they're based at is that, it, and it says, um, to the elementary principles of the world. And so you have those very base things that they are built around. In other words, a very humanistic look, look at things. And then it says, rather than according to Christ. So what Christ is teaching is completely different than the very foundation in which all human wisdom rests upon. Yes. He says you need to be careful. Clint, you have something? Yeah, I was just going to say that the word cheat here has this idea of being plundered or taken captive or almost being kidnapped. Yes. Where it, it literally takes you away from the truth and you can't receive it because you're taken away. You have been isolated in some form or fashion from the truth and you're, you're void of it. You can't get to it when you're in this state. Right. This goes to this idea of we are in a spiritual warfare. The enemy attacks us and takes us, carries us off captive. He'll carry us off. He makes spoil of us. He'll cheat us. He will rob us of truth and of righteousness. And this is exactly what they're dealing with with the Judaizing teachers who were teaching traditions that they, the traditions have become more important to them than actually God's word about these things. And that's what Christ pointed out over and over again to the Pharisees. But now the church is troubled by the same thing. The traditions are replacing the truth in some people's lives. Exactly, exactly right. And they're robbing their souls or taking their souls captive. Uh, there's empty deceit here, the false doctrine, false religion, the traditions of men, as opposed to the things revealed by Christ, as was mentioned just a moment ago. These are opposite things, are diametrically opposed to one another. Um, verses 9 and 10 then, how does he describe Christ? Anybody? Oh, sorry. Nancy. As a as a human in a body, in a human body, flesh body like we are. He came in the flesh, and what? What was dwelling in that flesh? All the <clears throat> all the fullness of Godhood, the Godhead deity. He was fully God while he was here on earth, and this is 
This is hitting at probably there's some Gnosticism starting to creep its way into Colossae. The idea that Jesus came, he didn't actually come in the flesh. He was just more of an apparition. He was more of a vision that people saw versus actual bodily living on this earth. So all of deity was in Christ. The fullness of what it is to be a deity was in Christ. All right, I hate to rush, but let's let's jump to 11 here. In fact, let's um, let's just read 11 to 23. Who will grab that for us? 11 to 23. Go ahead, Mike. And in him we were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile towards us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display to them, having triumphed over them through him. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath day things which were a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Was that verse 23 for you? I'm sorry, no. Which, were, which all refer to things to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of absolute no value against fleshly indulgence. Okay. So, question number five, I asked you to discuss the importance of circum the circumcision of Christ, including Old Testament significance of circumcision application to being a child of God. So, circumcision of Christ, what does he say that it is here? <clears throat> okay. When, when does that take place? Baptism. Takes place in baptism. Okay. What what was Old Testament circumcision? The skin. Cutting off, casting away the foreskin. Here he's talking about baptism in Christ is cutting off and casting away his sins. What was the... So, let me ask you this. When the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the land of Canaan, what did they have to do? Circumcise. They had to circumcise all the males because they hadn't done it. <laughs> because that was a sign of the covenant between them and God. <clears throat> Baptism is a sign of the covenant between us and God. If you don't have it, you're not in a covenant relationship with God. That, that's just as plain and simple. Now I understand in the Old Testament it was for males only. Okay? We understand in the New Testament that this covenant relationship is for all. That sign is for all. The commands are to all. There's no discrimination between male and female. Mike? We have this idea also, as you pointed out a couple of times, that there's this idea of warfare, whereas in the New Testament each soul becomes a warrior. And each soul becomes a soldier. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Old Testament, it was the male that were the soldiers and the warriors. And of certain ages. Right. Yeah, exactly right. All right, so question number six, I ask you to briefly discuss the importance of buried in verse 12 and look for related scripture. So let's just briefly touch on this. What about that idea of buried? 
God has said, God has said completely covered. Okay, completely covered. Right? Because that's what buried is. Right. In Romans 6, buried with him in baptism. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. We've been baptized into Christ. We're, we're buried in the water. So he talks about this burial and baptism, and it's raised with him through faith in the working of God. It's not faith in somebody dunking you under the water. Right? That's not where our faith is, but people try to make it that. They try to make it that somehow the action or the water has the power. But the action, the water, does not have the power. The power is in believing, being convicted, that this is what God would have me to do and I am submitting to His will. I'm think, yielding to that. I think that could probably be found in 1 Peter 3.21. Not to putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Exactly. Exactly. That answer of a good conscience or appeal of a good conscience, Mike. Well, whenever Paul was talking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says in verse 3, For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And so whenever we start reading these... Um, um, scriptures on baptism, it says that we kill the old man, we're buried, and we're raised. So in that is how we get into the gospel. There's no other way. And there's no other um, thing that you see that man has to do in order to tap into that gospel. Right. In Romans 6, to that point, it says we rise up to walk in newness of life. It's talking about you've been born again now. You rise up to walk now as a child of God after being buried. Well, and that's the same idea in 1 Peter 2 and 24 where he says that we, we having died to sin, might live for righteousness. So the burial is because it, something is dead. Something has to be dead to be buried. It has to be our sin. Right. Our life of sin. Yes. A lot of times you'll hear in the denominational world that uh, you don't have to be baptized. It's not uh, essential to your soul. Even Paul tells us, I did not come to baptize. And then they stop right there. Right. They don't read the rest of it. That's all they know is the one phrase. Did you not read all of it to understand it? And they live off of that. The majority do actually live off that one phrase. Yeah, it's, it's a shallow understanding of the Scripture because Paul has a, a different message there and a different point that he's making altogether. Exactly right. So we have this faith in the working of God that when I submit to His command, my sins are being forgiven. I rise up out of that water, my sins are gone. They're washed away. I don't have them anymore. If we don't have that conviction when we're buried in baptism, our sins won't be washed away. And that's why, you know, some people are like, well, I've already been baptized. Well, what did you understand when you were put under the water? If you didn't understand what it was about, what it was for, you're not scripturally baptized. I'm reminded of uh, Acts 22, 16, where God told Paul, Go into the city, there it would be told of you what you must do. My servant Ananias will tell you what you must do. Ananias approached him and says, Saul, why do you tarry? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The outsiders do not want to hear that. Right. There are a lot of people who resist it, there are a lot of people who have been cheated through vain philosophy and empty deceit into believing there's some other way. Yeah. And he's warning us here not to do that. Put our full faith in Christ. And here he's talking about you've been circumcised with him. You've had <coughs> these sins removed. You've had them taken away. The forgiveness of all of our sins is in Christ. Verses 13 and 14. And not where? 
What's he saying happened with Christ and being nailed to the cross? All that debt that we owe God because of our sins is now gone away because of what He did on that cross. It was all nailed to that cross for us. Okay. And what was taken away? The sins. Well, our sins are taken away. That's true. But he's mentioned something specific in verse 14. Decrees that were against us. Yeah, those decrees against us, the old law. Because remember, Paul, Peter said that why would you put on them the, the yoke that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Why would you do that? So the old law could only condemn. And here he's saying when Christ was nailed to the cross... That old law was done away with. It was taken out of the way. So these Judaizing teachers that are coming in among you, they're teaching you something that's going to condemn you. There's no value here for your redemption, your salvation. You've already been redeemed. You've already been saved in Christ. You were buried with Him in baptism. You rose up to walk in the newness of life. That's where the forgiveness is. Not in the old law. Don't go back there. Jim. Uh, when I'm talking to somebody of the uh, John 3.16 persuasion, I'll ask them, what was John, uh, what was John the Baptist doing? Then they'll say, well, he was baptized. I'll say, who approached him? Jesus. What did Jesus ask John to do? To baptize him? Jesus. And I'll say, why? why did, you, did Jesus do that? They don't have an answer. It's just, yeah, he... he he stays to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. He, he submitted to the teaching just as everybody else did that was given to John. Um, I thought I saw a clan or Mike or... No, Mike. Well, Christ was baptized for a different reason than all the Right. And um, I think to Jim's point, it shows that whatever the law is that God gives, you have to obey it. And um, looking at the at the context of where we've been talking about baptism and then um, you know what you were saying things being nailed to the cross if you continue on he starts talking about new moons festivals um, sabbaths he's already been talking about circumcision so we know the context in which he's making this statement is inside of the old law that they were that pointed out were being deceitfully taken captive from exactly exactly so he talks about the cross nullified or defeated all other systems is essentially what he's talking about. It, everything else is invalid. Only can you find redemption in the cross of Christ. Um, I'm going to cut it off there. We'll pick up, Lord willing. Well, I tell you what. It says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Um, the Jews, as a people, viewed the cross as an utter defeat for Jesus of Nazareth. The Gentiles viewed it as, this is a weak and pathetic man who met his just end. The Bible tells us that that wasn't the case at all. That the cross was actually the way, the mechanism through which he triumphed over them. Because he gave his life for the sins of the world. But then he was raised from the dead proving himself triumphant over the grave. Power over the grave. And now of course he's ascended and is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God. So the thing that they thought was his end and his greatest shame actually was his triumphal moment, if you will. Any other thoughts there? His sole purpose from birth was the cross. Exactly. Exactly right. All right, thank you all, Lord willing. Let's pick up in verse 16, Colossians 2, 16 next week. And I have no idea how far we'll get, but go ahead and do some, some of three as I hope to get into some of that. Thank you all.